a pleasure to be here with you today because it feels good when our challenges can make a positive difference in other people's lives. The title of my talk is Accepting Life Challenges Brings Better Parenting. But I'd like to add to that helps parenting be easier and brings more happiness. It also helps parents model healthy coping behaviors and a positive attitude for their children. Today I'm going to talk about how I learned to accept my challenges. And I'll include what I like to call pearls of wisdom. The first being a saying, what you resist will persist. The second, the serenity prayer. I'm going to use some of my challenges to show you how these pearls fit in and to show you examples of where I resisted my challenges and they did indeed get worse or persist and how I learned to accept them and the results that learning to accept my challenges brought. And I'll tell you my most difficult challenge when Heather was born 34 years ago, she's 34, and then her brother Logan was born three years later at 30 years old with visible multiple disabilities that I could see immediately when they were born. It's called Miller Syndrome. And Miller Syndrome does affect only 30 people that are documented worldwide. There's only one other family that have two children with Miller Syndrome, and they live in New Zealand. And we've met them at the Foundation for Nogger and Miller Syndrome, started by a mom who has a daughter with Miller Syndrome. So it's nice to have a connection with others. We didn't know for 33 years why Heather and Logan had Miller Syndrome. It was just last year that scientists sequenced our genome they looked at all of our genes. They actually found the gene that causes Miller syndrome. Mom and dad carry the gene. You have a 25% chance of the baby getting a gene from mom and a gene from dad and causing the disease. It's called a recessive gene. They also have a lung disease, which is not connected to Miller syndrome. And we didn't know what kind of lung disease it was or why they had it. But they found a gene for that as well. It's called primary ciliary dyskinesia, PCD. So the little cilii that are hair-like structures that help bring germs and dirt and bacteria out of our lungs, helps bring them out so that you don't get pneumonia. So Heather and Logan are prone to getting pneumonia a lot of the time. They also were diagnosed with autism five years ago. So that was a new challenge to learn to accept. And I'll tell you a little bit more about Heather and Logan a little bit later in the talk. When I heard this saying, what you resist will persist, approximately 25 years ago, I understood what it meant intellectually. But it wasn't until experiencing years of challenges and experiencing myself resisting those challenges and having the challenges get worse that I truly understood the meaning of that. Resistance comes in many packages. Anger, denial, ignoring the problem, procrastination. I'm sure that you can think of many packages that resistance comes in. What you resist will persist. Pretty much means if you ignore your problems, at best, they'll stay the same. But in my experience, they get worse. When I describe my challenges, I will show you examples of when I was resistant. And I'll tell you the steps that I learned towards acceptance and the results of both. 34 years ago, I was pregnant with my first baby. I was 20 years old, healthy. There was no reason to think 
think that anything would be wrong with my baby. My pregnancy was normal, other than morning sickness, 24-7. The whole 10 months, I never could figure out why they called it morning sickness. As I was pregnant, I wondered, will my baby be okay? And I looked around and I saw all the normal people that are born every day, and I thought, of course my baby will be okay. Why would anything be wrong with my baby? So the day finally came, 10 months later, I was driving to the hospital, and all of a sudden I panicked and I thought, I can't get out of this. I can't change my mind. I have to have this baby. More than anything, I was scared of the pain. So when I got to the hospital, the kind nurses assured me that everything would be all right. As I was being wheeled into the delivery room, I saw piles of pink and blue blankets, and I wondered, is my baby going to be a girl or a boy? Because we didn't have ultrasounds routinely back then, so I, I didn't know. We got into the delivery room, and there was a mirror placed on the ceiling where we could watch the delivery of our first baby. The doctors pulled Heather out of my body, and my eyes locked on her arms. They were bent 90 degrees from the wrist. You could not miss her arms, that they were different. But right away, my mind raced to the safe place of denial. They're not bent. Yes, they are. No, they're not bent. They're just bent temporarily because she's been in that small confined space for 10 months as soon as she's been out for a while. They'll straighten out. Then I heard Heather's dad say, something's wrong with her arms. And then I knew, something's wrong with my baby's arms. And I looked up at the doctor and I said, is everything else okay besides her arms? And he said, I'm sorry, Debbie. She only has eight fingers and eight toes, which was unreal because people would say to her dad, what do you want, a boy or a girl? And he'd say, I don't care as long as it has 10 fingers and 10 toes. We've all heard that saying. They took Heather to another area because she was having trouble breathing. And the doctor came to me with compassion in his eyes and he said, I'm so sorry, Debbie. This isn't the kind of baby I am. I was willed into recovery with my mind racing. I wanted to pretend like none of this was happening. I'm just going to go home and pretend like this didn't happen and get pregnant again and have a different baby and put this all behind me. When I got to the delivery, to the recovery room, Heather's dad went to call our parents. When he came back, there was an awkward silence. And finally I said, I don't want this baby. And he said, I don't either. What are we going to do? And for those of you that are a little uncomfortable right now because Heather's sitting here and I'm saying I didn't want her when she was born, she understands knee-jerk reactions. She's had a few of those herself in her 34 years. And she also understands denial. So she and Logan both have experienced their entire life of unconditional love. So hearing this does not affect you. I was wheeled to my room where the pediatrician was waiting to tell me about the examination he'd given to my baby. The first thing he said was, she has a club palate. And then he went on to describe what a cleft palate is. It's where you have a hole in the roof of your mouth, so you can't get any suction. So you're not able to suck on the breast or on a nipple. And they would have to use a special feeder to feed Heather so she would get her nutrition. So he went on to say, she has small cup-shaped ears. And I said, well, can she hear? And he said, we don't know. 
Our air canals are so tiny, we can't actually look in there and see eardrums. We'll just have to wait and see. And then he said, there's something wrong with their eyes, but we're not sure what it is, because they're still swollen from birth. I said, can she see? And he said, we don't know. Her eyes are still dusty. Again, we'll just have to wait and see. Then he described her arms. He said her forearm is half the length of a normal forearm. And her wrists are bent 90 degrees with her palms facing each other. And she only has three permanently bent fingers and a thumb and eight toes. And then he added, at least everything's symmetrical. And I thought, symmetrical? After the doctor left, I had a few visitors, my family, and as you can imagine, I was pretty much like a robot in shock. After all my visitors left, I was exhausted. Heather was born around 5 p.m., so it wasn't long before I finally got to see the comfort of sleep. However, I woke up, like you've all experienced, thinking you had a nightmare, and suddenly I realized it's not a nightmare. It's true. It's really happening. And I would cry myself back to sleep. That must have happened four or five times that night. In the morning, I still wasn't ready to face my new reality. So I called the nurse's station, and I asked if they would stop all my phone calls because I wasn't ready to hear the words, I'm so sorry. If I heard those words, I would have to admit that something terrible had happened, and I wasn't ready. I cried all day long until late afternoon and then I started to get curious, or maybe it was maternal instincts that set in. But I wanted to see the baby. So I slipped on my house coat and my slippers, and I walked down to the nursery. And I stood outside the nursery window. There was only one baby in the nursery, and her name was Heather Madsen. And I thought, that poor baby. She's all alone in there because the other babies are with their mother and her mother doesn't want her. And I'm the mother. So a kind nurse, she walked up and she put her arm around me and she said, would you like to hold her? Well, I didn't know what I wanted. But I said, okay. So she took me to the back room, and I sat in a rocking chair. Then two nurses came in, and they brought Heather. And they said, would you like to watch us feed her? So I watched them feed her with a special feeder that looks like a turkey baster, with a rubber tube on the end. They wanted to try and squirt the milk down her throat before it could come out her nose. Because if you have a hole in the roof of your mouth, it will out your nose faster than it goes down. They cleaned her up, they placed her in my arms, and they left me alone for you, baby. And I just sat there and I looked at her and I thought, this is the baby that was inside me for 10 months. This is the baby that I was thinking about all the time, the baby that was kicking me. This is the baby that I was waiting for. And even though she had all of her problems, I was marveling at the miracle of creating a life. The nurses came back in and they quickly took her away so that she could be taken care of and they could help her breathe. And I was wheeled. I went back to my room. Terry, Heather's dad, came to visit me that night. And he wasn't ready to see her yet. So I respected that, even though I was a little disappointed. Because by this time, I accepted that she was my baby and I was her mother. 
They brought us the dinner that celebrates that you had a new baby girl. They had a little pink baby on the cake. But it wasn't a very happy time for us. After we started our dinner, there was a knock at the door, and it was a whole team of doctors. And the head of the doctors was a heart specialist. And he said, they called me at home and said, this baby has a heart murmur. She's aspirating, which means she's not breathing very well. And she has jaundice. He said, it doesn't sound like this baby's going to make it. And I wondered why they even called me. But I just couldn't eat my dinner, knowing that I hadn't tried. So he asked us to sign forms, giving permission to take her to Primary Children's Hospital and do a heart catheter to find out why her heart had a murmur. And at the same time, he had us sign permission to do an autopsy. So we signed the papers and they left. And we were left to think about that autopsy. So they obviously don't think she's going to live. And after getting a little time for that to sit with us and discuss it, we thought, well, maybe it's for the best because she would suffer and we don't know how to be her parents. So we actually started to feel a little bit of relief that she wasn't going to live. Three hours later, the doctor came back and he showed us a picture of her heart and he said, if I had known it looked that good, I wouldn't have done anything. It was just a little valve that usually closes by the time the baby's a year old. He said it would probably close and there wouldn't be problems with her heart. But she was still having trouble breathing and she still had jaundice. So they still couldn't tell us if she was going to make it. The next morning I could have stayed because back then the insurance allowed three days in the hospital. We didn't have any drive-through deliveries like <laughs> some of the young mothers today have. But I didn't want to stay at the hospital. I just wanted to get up to Primary Children's Hospital as fast as I could because I wanted to be with my baby. As I was being wheeled out of the hospital, it was another sad time. Because while I was pregnant, I pictured daddy's carrying the baby in the new sweater set that I crocheted, wrapped in a new blanket that we tied at my baby's shower. But that wasn't how this was turning out, and it was very sad. When we arrived at Primary Children's Hospital, Heather was in intensive care. And the minute I saw her, I just thought how tiny she looked, even though she was 8 pounds, 14 ounces. And she looked so helpless in her isolate that was helping her breathe. She lay there on her stomach, asleep, but she didn't really look like she was asleep because her lower eyelid was missing. So her eyes looked open, even when they were closed. I held Heather as much as those doctors would let me hold her. All I wanted to do was bring her home and be her mother. I went up there every day from morning till night for two weeks. They still wouldn't tell me if she was going to make it or not, but I told them I just want to take her home and be her mom. They said, well, if you learn how to chew feed her, we'll let you take her home because our biggest concern is that she won't get enough nutrition. So I put the tube down her throat, into her stomach, and then you put the formula into a syringe and you just let gravity take it down. So I learned how to do that and I was scared, but I really wanted to take my baby home. As I was leaving the hospital, a nurse gave me a lamb's nipple, which is about three inches long, a great big black nipple. And then she made the hole just a little bit bigger so that when I squeezed the ball on the end of the syringe, it would squirt milk down Heather's throat. So when I got Heather home, that's how I fed her. Pretty much all day, watching soap operas, all day long. <laughs> Then Heather developed honor above her age level, which was wonderful. 
And when she was a year and a half old, the geneticist called me because we didn't have any answers as to what syndrome she had or what it was or why it happened or if it would happen again. So the geneticist said, we believe your baby has a syndrome called postaxial acrofacial dysostosis. That is a mouthful. <laughs> I was so happy that they named it Miller Syndrome after Dr. Miller, who wrote the first article about it in the medical journals. And then he continued to say, this is just a fluke, a chain mutation. It happened, it won't happen again. Your chances of having another baby are probably even better than someone else's. Well, I was happy. I wanted to have another baby. So I planned to get pregnant and have the baby born when Heather was three and out of diapers. So when I ran across an article in a magazine that said how to have a boy, I followed the instructions. And I guess it worked. <laughs> well, at seven months along, I wanted to get an ultrasound because I just wanted to have reassurance because I felt very confident that this baby was going to be healthy and normal and not have the same problems. But I wanted reassurance. So I went in and I had an ultrasound. And the ultrasound technicians told me that I had a healthy girl. <laughs> <laughs> so I waited and waited for Logan's birth. And I finally went into labor on April Fool's Day. He's my April Fool's baby. <laughs> well, here we go, back to the hospital, being wheeled into the delivery room, seeing the pink and blue blankets, wondering if it's really a girl or not. <laughs> Watching in the mirror, the doctor pulled Logan out. What a shock, in a different way. The same arms, exactly the same bent arms, 90 degrees. Heather was three by then, so I was used to that and familiar with the challenges, and I loved her with all my heart, but I wanted to nurse. I heard the weight dropped off when you nurse, <laughs> and I really wanted to nurse, so I made a great big cape, and I embroidered a sign on it that says, out to lunch, because I was determined to nurse in public. After all, nursing is supposed to be convenient. So I said to the doctor, does he have a cleft palate too? And the doctor said, yes. Does. So I was disappointed that I couldn't nurse. I was going to have to lose my weight the hard way. So they took Logan away because he, like Heather, was having some trouble breathing. And when I was in the delivery, when I was in the recovery room, the pediatrician came in. He was Heather's pediatrician, and he slapped me on the leg and he said, "Congratulations, you just made medical history." When Heather was born, there were only three cases in medical history, so there had never been a reoccurrence of this syndrome. I wasn't offended by his comments. Maybe I, I have a little delayed reaction sometimes when people make off-the-wall comments. It takes me a little while to process them. But when I tell the medical students that he said that, they're pretty astonished at that. So I had my little boy. I wanted a little boy. And I called my friends and told them I got my boy, and he's just like Heather except he has red hair. And they'd say, April Bowles. I said, no, really? He's just like Heather and he has real red hair. So Logan was in the hospital for two weeks because he too was having trouble breathing and they were having trouble keeping him from aspirating on the formula. <clears throat> so finally the day came for me to take Logan home. So Terry brought Heather to the hospital and we gave Heather her new baby, which was a little rubber doll, so that she could give her baby a bath when I was giving the baby a, my baby a bath. And the four of us went home. So Logan aspirated on the formula within the first week. And we had to rush into the hospital with aspiration pneumonia. It was a terrible experience. I was so afraid that he was going to die. So as soon as I got him home, I didn't take any more chances. I too fed Logan for six months and got very comfortable and very familiar with the whole process. So my life 
continued with surgeries, challenges, times too. I loved my children, and their father loved them. But our, our life was filled with stress from surgeries and financial problems, and it took its toll. We lost our home. I watched the bank drive away our car. And eventually, we filed bankruptcy. Terry resisted our challenges. And he did this by responding by having an affair. So we were divorced when Heather was five and Logan was two. When I was left a single mother, committed to not getting married until they were 18, so that I could get help from Medicaid to pay all of their medical bills. I was a hairstylist, so I did a few haircuts in the basement. And I started teaching aerobics so I could be paid to exercise, help make ends meet. But mostly, I lived on child support and government assistance. Even though I did my very best to handle all my challenges, it became obvious that I too was resisting my challenges when I developed an eating disorder, bulimia, which I had for three years. I hit bottom when I found myself on the main level of Cottonwood Hospital, on the telephone, calling the third floor, which was the eating disorder clinic, and I was sobbing. They asked me to come up, and they wanted to hospitalize me, and I said, that's impossible. So they connected me with a good counselor that specialized with eating disorders, and I joined a support group. It was at the support group that I learned my second pearl of wisdom, serenity. At first, all I could do was chant the serenity prayer. When I was feeling my most overwhelming emotional challenges that I just felt like I couldn't bear, I would just chant the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I would chant that over and over and over. And what it did was it helped calm my mind because it helped distract me on something positive and mind calming. And that's later I learned the actual steps that helped me to acceptance. So the first step is to calm my mind. For me, it was chanting the serenity prayer. The second step was look at my challenges and decide, can I change what I'm having such a big problem with? Or do I have to accept it? And the third step is once you decide, take action. Take action on what you can change. And don't focus on what you can't change. By to do that, you can visualize what you want to create and get that vision in your mind and then just do everything possible to make that vision a reality. A couple months ago, I was telling Logan these steps and he looked up at me and he said, Mom, what if you can't look at the challenge? And he, I was stunned. You can't even do step one, look at the challenge. <laughs> and I thought about it and I thought, well, that's when you ask for help. That's when you have to ask for help to look at your challenge, whatever that help looks like for you. And then he said, well, how do I accept it? And I said, you focus on what you can change. Put, put what you can change into a compartment, which is the I can't change this Department, and then you focus on what you can change, something that can make your life better. At times during Heather and Logan's childhood, I truly was tortured with my sadness because of their disabilities. And I was terrified of the stares and teasing. I was truly racked with pain. I would be rolled up in a little ball on the floor, sobbing, until there literally were no more tears. And 
Then I was just left blank. And in that blankness, it's when I could think more clearly. And so I looked at what I was sad about. And then I realized, I can't change how they look. I can't change their disabilities. I can't control what people think. I can't control the stares, and I can't control the teasing. I have to accept that. So I started to focus on what I wanted to create. I got that vision in my mind. What do I want to do to make my life better? And I focused on that. And I took action to make that vision a reality. I started looking in the phone book for phone numbers. I went online and looked for phone numbers and organizations. I called the government to find out what kind of assistance was available. I asked people. Most of the time, I did not even know what question I was going to ask. I just called and fumbled around until I could get them to understand what I was asking for and guide me to the right person. I found help. Heather has a degree in psychology. Logan has a degree in graphic design. I found help to get them an education. I also found help to give them employment ideas. So they tried different types of employment with their degrees. And I also found help to help them live independently. They both live in their own apartment, independently, drive their own cars. I was able to find help because I was able to take action. Heather is a writer, and she's written a lot of the writings in my book, Eight Fingers and Eight Toes, Accepting Life Challenges. She also was published in the University of Utah Help Eat Connections newsletter because Heather's a specialist in autism and she likes to help others understand autism and help them know what they can do to help their families. She also has a goal to write a book about autism. And now that I've published a book, maybe I can help her achieve that goal too. That'll be our next focus. Logan has a degree in graphic design and is an artist. And he paints with oils and acrylics. And he's painted some beautiful flowers so that he could get a collection of the same category of items that he had an exhibit at Art Access Gallery in 2006. And because I was able to find help and get government funding, we were able to get greeting cards and prints made from his art because Logan experiences chronic pain. And he can't paint originals as fast as people that don't have physical challenges. So he paints originals and he sells his greeting cards and his art. Right now they're at Art Access Gallery. And I sell them at my hair salon where I do hair. And Loving has a website and a card. So you can get more information about that. But mostly, they both work full time living in their bodies. And that's pretty much what I tell people. The best thing I've learned was accepting my challenges. It made it possible for me to make conscious decisions and take conscious action to create results. I was a better parent and happier because I accepted my challenges. It helped me to live with no regrets. It helped me to live with hope and an optimistic attitude. And I've developed greater empathy and compassion for other people, especially people that have challenges. And this has increased my capacity to love more and find joy in my life. I'm still a hairstylist and an aerobic instructor. I'm happily married and I love to hike with my husband to help add to my physical fitness, which helps give me energy to continue creating positive things in our lives. In summary, I have talked about the phrase, what you resist will persist, and the serenity prayer, and what I understand this to mean. And I've given examples of acceptance and resistance and steps to learning how to accept your problems and your challenges. 
Step one is mind calming thoughts. Step two, look and decide. Do I have to accept this or can I change it? Step number three, take action and make your vision become a reality and do it. Through my personal history, I've shown examples of situations where I resisted and the consequences of that. And then the results when I accepted and made positive things in my life. By not resisting life's challenges and by making conscious choices <coughs> about change and acceptance, I am living a more fulfilled and happy life. I'd like to invite you to visit our booth, number 1020. And Logan and Heather are here, and they'll be at the booth, and we'll be happy to answer your questions and talk to you in any way that you would like us to. And we'll be having our book there for sale. And Logan's art, his greeting cards, and some of his prints. Have a great day. Thank you.